Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Digital Woodcarver live event. My name is Laney Shaughnessy, and normally joining me would be my co-host, Burl Tishner. Burl Tishner is running a little bit behind. He'll be joining us a little bit later. But in the meantime, uh, we are going to continue on with the show at our normal time. I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight, and um, uh, I want to welcome all of you. Tonight, we are discussing the topic of finishes, different types of finishing uh, for your projects, uh, different type of finishes uh, and uh, techniques and things like that. Um, the uh, main uh, premises of this of tonight is to uh, give you a general idea of the different types of finishes, the different, you know, tips and, and techniques uh, that are, you know, utilized or that you could utilize. Uh, with your projects, uh, we're going to kind of, I'm going to quote some of the uh, Digital Woodcarver owners and uh, their finishing tips and things, and we're going to cover all of that. And like I said, uh, you know, Burl uh, will jump in a little later and uh, join us. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a great time to, you know, while we're going through this, uh, to ask questions and uh, get uh, answers and things like that. Uh, so with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So welcome uh, Ronnie, Sam, William, Harvey, Charles, Henry, Tim, and everyone else that is joining us live tonight. Um, so when it comes to finishes, we have different types of uh, uh, products that we could uh, talk about. Not, not, I don't want to get hung up specifically on brand names, right? I want to talk more about the types of finishes uh, that are out there and, and prepping your work and everything. Now, um, with that being said, let's talk about uh, uh, getting started, kind of the prep of the job. Uh, one of the uh, preps, depending on your, you know, your project, if you are looking to uh, paint your finish, uh, paint your finish. If you're going to paint your project, <laughs> paint your finish. Uh, some of the uh, types of finishes, uh, prep materials uh, are things like Aura Mask. Um, Aura Mask, uh, in my case, uh, Aura Mask 813 uh, is a stencil film. Uh, it's perfect for um, protecting your material covering your it's got an adhesive back on it so you can cover your board like we see in the picture here uh prior to carving and it cuts beautifully it creates a nice stencil if you will that you can paint uh and um when the paint dries uh and all just peel and you know finish the project in the case of this project here, this project had multiple colors to it. So uh, a great use for the Aura Mask 813 uh, is uh, when you have something that's that's going to be technically, you know, difficult for as far as painting. Uh, in this case, I had black, red, brown, you know, going on in there. And I wanted the natural color of the wood to be the background. So the Aura Mask allowed me to cover my entire project uh, to carve that entire project. And then the only exposed areas are the areas that are going to be painted. And then I could either spray paint, brush paint, whatever the case may be, uh, to achieve, uh, you know, the multicolor, uh, finish that, uh, was utilized, uh, in this project. Now, when it comes to the finishes, uh, in the paints and everything in general, uh, and by the way, there's different uh, forms of Aura Mask. There's like Aura Mask 813, which is this blue stencil film here. It's got a little bit more of an adhesion to it. Uh, there's also the Aura Mask. Um, I believe it is the Aura Mask. Oh, I don't want to get the number wrong. Bear with me here. 631, I think it is. Aura Mask 631 which has a lighter uh, adhesion. And typically like the 631 would be great if you're pre-painting your board. Uh, let's say that uh, I wanted a 
blue board. Uh, and then I wanted to, you know, uh, paint all the carved areas different colors. Well, I would put my paint on first, let that dry completely, you know, paint that board, that entire color, let that dry completely, and then I could apply the ore mask. Now, the 813 with its adhesion might end up, because it is a little bit tougher adhesion and all, it might pill up that pre-painted board. It might pill up some of the paint. We'd have to do some touch-up. So the Aura Max 631 has a lighter adhesion, uh, which would be great for, uh, you know, not um, damaging the, the pre-painted uh, uh, material and stuff. So 813 or 631, I believe it's 631. Yeah, it's a uh, lighter adhesion and everything and all. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, the paints, uh, you know, different paints and things like that, believe it or not, uh, I get the best results with the least inexpensive paints. Uh, this is a very simple, inexpensive project source paint. Uh, I mean, I think it's like a buck a can uh, from Lowe's and everything. And this is a matte black finish uh, and everything. And I get a really nice finish with that, you know. Uh, a lot of times with the paint and primer finishes uh, and all, uh, have a difficult time with those sometimes. They, you know, they're kind of, they come out thick or heavy and stuff. But I have to admit now uh, that uh, sign I just showed you, I did paint with the paint and primer finishes, this Krylon uh, Color Max, and it did very good. So uh, maybe it's the particular type of brand of primer paint finishes that you you know you might uh, you know have troubles with and stuff, or it just might be the application. I may have been you know too heavy on my coats uh, you know for it to build up, but uh, there's some of those uh, finishes that those paints that really build up. Uh, I really like the inexpensive paint because it uh, it does a really nice clean light coat uh, and multiple small coats, not one big heavy coat, but multiple light coats. Uh, is going to give you a better result so the, the paint doesn't build up and pile up and letting it dry between coats a little bit, you know, 15, 20 minutes or whatever uh, between coats before your next coat, uh, you'll be good. Um, so when it comes to paints, I don't really have a, you know, a particular uh, preference and things, uh, just whatever works best for you. And I sometimes find that the inexpensive paints are better for me. The only problem with the inexpensive paints, they don't come in a whole lot of different colors. You know, with the uh, paint and primer mixes, I can get satin burgundy. I can get, you know, aquamarine and, you know, all these different color, you know, combinations that uh, uh, that are out there and stuff. I have, you know, there's more options with those paint and primers. Now, some paints, um, one of the things we want to be mindful of is wicking, the wicking of the paint. Basically, when we are carving, we're creating an open end grain in that material. Uh, and when we paint that, that liquid can wick up in underneath our protective coating, our aura mask and stuff, and we can get some nasty results and things, uh, you know, where we'd have to do a lot of sanding to try to get that out. And then sometimes we have to do so much sanding that we end up, you know, ruining the project. So, uh, one of the things that I like to do is prep my material. Uh, after I carve, before I paint, I add an undercoating and I like to use the Zinser shellac. Uh, it dries in minutes, literally a couple of minutes. Uh, it dries in a, a few multiple coats. And for me, that will seal that open end grain that we've created by the carving. Uh, and then I can put my, you know, my paint finish on uh, because it works great as a top coat or an undercoat. Shellac does. Uh, and um, uh, it will help kind of seal that to prevent that wicking. Now, a another actual paint, which is more of an ink than a paint, uh, is Marsh. And I don't have a can of Marsh, M-A-R-S-H, spray ink. Uh, but Marsh spray ink is, uh, it is a, it's a, um, most professional sign companies and stuff will use the Marsh uh, spray ink. Uh, when it paints on, man, it, it, it's almost like powder coating, if you will, in my, in my opinion, the way I look at it, because uh, within moments, I can see it kind of haze over and it looks like a, a powder coat, if you will. Uh, and it's, and it doesn't wick. Uh, and um, 
uh, it's got a deep, rich color. Now it comes in the primary colors, red, black, white, green, blue, you know, the prime colors. Uh, it doesn't come in odd little like, you know, fuchsia or anything like that. Um, but marsh spray ink is phenomenal. I love it, uh, especially when I'm working, uh, you know, with uh, signs where I want not a really gloss look because it's it's more of a matte uh, kind of finish. Uh, the marsh is, but I want, you know, that matte finish in my carving and then my clear coat, if I want a semi-gloss, a gloss, or, you know, a hand rub look or whatever, I'll do that. But uh, marsh, M-A-R-S-H is a good, and you can get that on Amazon. But uh, other than that, I like the inexpensive paints and I always uh, pre-prime, usually don't have to pre-prime with the marsh and stuff, but I always pre-prime and I say prime, not primer like paint, but pre-prime basically seal my material with my shellac and the zinser you know of course um comes in you know a brush on formula or a rattle can and it all depends on the size of my project and what i'm doing uh depending on if i use the rattle can or if i use a brush finish and stuff and uh i believe old burl is uh just popped in if, uh burl hey, how you doing i'm doing good on. I didn't need them Sorry about being late. Talking to everybody. How you doing, sir? Doing okay. Checking my volume here. I hear you just fine. Uh, Burl, we were just getting started, and we were talking about, uh, we started off with talking a little bit about Aura Mask, uh, and um, we talked uh, about um, kind of pre-sealing our carved areas before adding some paint. So we're just getting into the, the beginnings of things. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Everybody give old bro a welcome, warm welcome and all. Um not being like uh everyone. No, that's okay. Bro had family in town, so he I was did. he was uh hosting them. Uh now uh Burl, when it uh comes to uh the aura mask and everything, I was showing them uh basically how an application of aura mask would be yeah. applied uh prior to painting and, and it acts like a stencil. Uh, yes. and everything and uh, that allows for if you're doing some kind of decorative multicolor project or something and all and then we were just talking about the different types of paints and and and, and what the steps would be so you haven't missed much uh, and also we're 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 back in the groove here yeah. uh, and uh, so we when we were talking about the paints bro I was talking about like I get good results actually from the inexpensive paints from Lowe's for, and uh, the prime or finish paints. But then we started talking about Marsh, the spray ink, you know, yep. that uh, yep. is really good for not wicking. Cause I was talking about when right. we're carving, we're That's creating an yep. end grain. Uh, and in that open end grain, in that carving, it has a tendency to wick yep. uh, into the projects and all. And Marsh is good for that. Uh, and if not, I always seal. Yes. My opening grain before uh, I paint. We're talking about shellac yeah. uh, and everything. So uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to basically uh, give uh, a little rundown on is I wanted to explain the difference between uh, lacquers, shellacs, uh, and uh, varnishes and things uh, briefly for people that are kind of new to finishing and all. Right. Uh, so shellac is a natural finish, uh, guys and girls. Um, it is actually made from uh, naturally from the secretion of the lac bug with some other solvents like alcohol mixed together to create the shellac finish and all. Uh, it creates a nice warm tone. Uh, it, it even though it says uh, clear on the cans and stuff, it does have kind of a warmer tone. It kind of gives a little bit of a yellowing, uh, if you will, uh, just a not yellowing but warm feeling. And all but it dries really fast. It's great as a top coat, but also good as an undercoat and everything. Um, and uh, it is mostly a burl, I would say, mostly an indoor finish, uh, you know, right? Uh, but um, it, it if you're using a top because it, it can be used as an undercoat and all, uh, it, you could do outdoors, but I it's mostly indoors for me, uh, is what my recommendation is on shellac right. now. When it comes to polyurethanes, uh, where's my polyurethane? I got two different kinds of poly. Uh, this one is a polycrylic. 
Yep. yep, it's a water-based polyurethane. So this is good for if you're using water-based paints or or you know finishes or like stains, water-based stains and things. Uh, you do not oil and water don't mix, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, if you're yes. going to use water-based stains, you want to use a water-based finish. And uh, the polyacrylic, uh, it's fast drying. It is uh, good for indoor and outdoor use, uh, and uh, it's a good all around uh, protection of water resistance and stuff. Um, basically, if I could just summarize what a polyurethane is, um, it's a plastic-like form. Of, it's a plastic-like finish in, in the form of a liquid. Uh, and it's, uh, it's available both in water-based and oil-based. And I don't know where my oil-based is. Here's a... Yeah. Here's I'll a have to example. admit, it's been a while since I've used the water-based... Um, I'm a little partial to the <laughs> oil base, just a yep. little bit old fashioned. I know the water is a little more environmentally, uh, probably, um, and also clean up and, and, you know, products that you use it with around. Um, I got a little bit, and this has been a few years ago since I've used it. Um, some of the technology changes with chemicals and stuff, um, had a little bit of a cloudy, yes. Uh, film that I would get off of it versus like the oil was a little clearer. You're exactly right. So just like the shellac, the water-based polyurethane does not hold up well to heat and chemicals. Right. Um, and uh, so the water-based fan, the you know poly does not hold up as well as the oil base. So Burl is exactly correct right. with that. Um, now it is good for uh, things like you know different types of signs, but also furniture and, and things like that. Right. But we also have a wipe on poly versus a brush on poly. Uh, now the wipe on poly is, uh, gives you a little bit of a faster application. Uh, it's mixed with um, basically uh, other drying agents uh, such as naphtha and, and other things uh, to allow it to dry a little faster. But um you you have the ability to kind of control the the finish and, and and not get as many brush strokes like sometimes me and polly don't get along burl uh she mm -hmm. always messes up some of my projects uh because i i tend to i used to use the brush on finish and i'd always get brush strokes and yes. then you never want to try to keep going right you you know you want to sand between the coats uh, and things and it, you know if you got brush strokes let them sit there and then you can sand that coat down and put your next coat on and stuff but I used yeah. to, you know, I used to kind of just kind of, oh man, I'm trying to keep going. And all I'm doing right. is just messing it up more and more and more. Right. And that. So I ended up switching to a wipe on poly, which kind of helped me with that. Because if you learn how to use poly correctly, it's a good, yeah. good fit. You know, well, uh, and I was going to bring up where I've got, and I've done many of trim with a poly shade. If you ever want to shade with it and done that for years. Um, I, if I'm doing small projects like that, Lainey, a lot of times I know it's a little more expensive. The aerosol, uh, will help with those eliminating some of those brush marks. Um, right. yeah, it is a little more expensive because of, you know, you only get, um, however many ounces, 12 or so ounces with it, um, that you pay for, for the can. Uh, the other thing I liked about the aerosol, and this is just me, uh, I know everybody's got opinions. So obviously we're just you know, throwing some ideas to try to get people, uh, you know, when we wanted to do finishes, uh, we did the CNC and projects, but obviously we're interested in the whole process of this. Uh, we want you to be successful and anything that we can help you, uh, or, you know, show people, uh, what you can do with a machine. Yeah, we can cut a nice project, but if it's not finished properly, um, you know, somebody's going to say that looks terrible. I, I won't buy it or, you know, as a gift and it's like, you know, you get that, Oh, that's nice. You know, but yet it gets thrown in the trash can. Um, but, you know, a lot of times uh, I will use the, you know, the spray. Two reasons that I like the spray is number one, you can feather it in a little bit better. Um, no streak marks. Um, but the other thing is, is uh, I, I'm a little lazy. So cleaning <laughs> up the brushes and stuff like that. The aerosol, right. Yeah. You know, you don't have to, there's no cleanup uh, afterwards on that. Tends to be what I've found is though you you probably the overall work with the aerosol is a little more because your your coats are a little thinner. It's a slow build. It's exactly. Slow build. It is a slow build. You got to build. You got to do more of those as you're as you're doing. But that's just me. Um, I'm not a great finisher, so I don't any comments that I'm making here is just things that I've 
done and, and learned over the, uh, you know, what years I've been doing, you know, woodworking uh, when it comes to that. So, um, so that's just a few things I wanted to throw out talking about yeah. brush wipe uh, spray and stuff like that. Okay. And that, and that's exactly, uh, exactly correct. Now, let me just say this, um, on all the polys, you want to sand between the coats and what Burl yeah. was saying as far as cleanup. Now with that polycrylic, the water base, typically, you know, soap and water cleanup, you know, warm water and soap for cleaning up your water based finishes with poly. It's a mineral spirits, uh, cleanup. And like Burl said, you know, sometimes, you know, that's just daunting and stuff. Uh, yeah. I tend to use chip yeah. brushes, yeah. but you do right. Right brush <laughs> but, <laughs> but it also you know it, it is that you have to use chemicals and stuff like that now laney right. you made a point that i wanted to if you don't mind me bringing up here on finishes and i think most people will understand this but i wanted to bring this up what i have found those first couple coats your surfaces a lot of times are very rough meaning mm -hmm. those fibers are sticking up uh, when you do it the the it creates, it almost looks like, man, this looks terrible. It is very important. And what I wanted to point out was what you were saying is sanding, especially those first couple coats. Um, I found out you got to get those, you know, put that, that hard surface on there. Yes, you will see, you know, the little fibers sticking up, but those first couple coats you put on there and then sanding that smooth, that's where you're going to start. Then your coats after that seem to be much smoother and lay down and less work after those first initial coats. It's, yeah. It's, it's my personal. Um, it, uh, exactly. And I especially have. with water-based finishes and everything. Now mm -hmm. in general yeah. finishing, Burl, uh, when, when finishing projects, uh, especially if you're going to be using water-based finishes and stuff, it's a good idea to pop the grain uh, mm -hmm. to kind of dampen the material uh, with just a right. wet rag right. and all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then sand it down. And that will keep that, that will sometimes keep that grain from repopping, uh, right. you know, fiber. The only thing that makes that hard is we can't really do that with a 3D carving, right? If that's exactly. difficult, if we can't sand yeah. it. So as Burl was saying, you know, you may get those fibers and everything that pop up, but, you know, as you, you know, sand, and I use a buffing, uh, not a, a buffing wheel, a, a, a sanding mop. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 Has a bunch of fingers and. Yeah. 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 And it's gentle on my 3D carvings that it doesn't really damage my detail uh, that much uh, or anything like that. But it gets kind of in the grooves versus like, you know, trying to use like an orbital sander. It's, it's, you can't do that uh, and everything. So right. uh, guys, girls, their oil based finishes are going to be a little less likely to pop the grain, but it will. It still will. There, there's no ifs, ands about it. But let me just say this as far as um, uh, brushing versus a wipe on. Um, it's, uh, you know, the wipe on is good for uh, interior use. Uh, it does provide that kind of hand rub beauty, you know, if you will. Uh, and um, you with the wipe on for me, you don't have to worry about brush marks. It's great for furniture uh, signs, indoor signs and things, railings, furniture and trim and stuff. Uh, now, wipe on does cost about twice as much as the spray or the brush on. Um, and it is a slow build, just like the spray is a slow build. Uh, so it takes a lot more coats to build up and match what a brush on would do. However, that being said, the speed of spray or wipe on, uh, the speed of the application, it off, it, it, most times it offsets and makes up for that extra cost. So I, that's kind of my last take on that. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, less drying time in between, right. obviously, the thinner coats. And yeah, yeah exactly. there's pros and cons with, with all of it. So, yeah. <laughs> with Sorry. Yep. Exactly right. All right. So uh, now I wanted to, um, uh, and, and there's some questions coming up. And guys, I'm going to get to your question in a second. But the last thing I want to talk about is kind of in our categories is, is, is your varnishes and things. And now there's a, we're going to be talking about stains and pre-sealers and, and wipe on oils and stuff. But I would just want to kind of classify shellac polyurethane and, you know, and volley, uh, uh, varnish. Uh, but uh, varnish is a generically used term uh, for your top coat. Uh, they, it's, you know, it's not a particular brand or anything like that. A varnish is basically, it's a top coat. Um, it, uh, it, like a spar varnish. This is uh, Helmsville spray on spar varnish and my green can kind of disappears in my green screen background, but uh, Helmsville uh, spar urethane. Now, this is great for outdoor projects on raw wood uh, for exterior use. Uh, and um, 
So uh, it's got UV protection in it. It is uh, often, uh, it's great water protection and things like that. So uh, outdoor signs and stuff. Uh, you want to make sure you're using the right woods, you know, like cedars or white oak or things that are kind of naturally resistant to the environment. But a yeah. good finish, especially if you're doing outdoors and all, you know, um, your spar, your thing. So a varnish is a uh, the term for a top coat. Uh, and uh, in this case, the spar varnish is a marine top coat. And it's great for outdoor finishes on raw woods and materials and You'll see it mostly used in things like wooden boats, decks, you know, outdoor chairs and furniture. But we also have we're carvers. We have outdoor signs. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, with that being said, uh, and kind of that was just kind of my little uh, summary of the three. But with that being said, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is when it comes to outdoor signs. Um there's different materials we can use, right, Burl? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, other than our woods that are naturally, res you know, prone to um, rot resistant. Yeah. Rot resistant. Thank you very much. I was getting tongue tied there uh, yeah. that are naturally prone to that. We're also, we have materials like UH, uh, wait, UHD, ultra high density sign foam and sign materials right. and stuff. And um, let me see if I can pull up our photo here. I was well, say, did you get the photo of our? I did. I sure did. did. Let me grab that. Oh, there it is. I uh, skipped it there, and let's pull that up. Uh, we got a pretty cool sign uh, that uh, we got two of them that hang on both of our buildings and stuff. Uh, right. Typically, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever see signs like outside of uh, subdivisions and and things, you know, that have the subdivision name or building signs like uh, what Burl's got here on his building and all. This is a UHD ultra high density sign foam. Now it's expensive. Yeah. Uh, it comes in different thicknesses and things, but uh, this, it doesn't warp, twist, expand, contract. Uh, it handles all the elements well. It paints beautifully and it carves like butter. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, just amazing. Now it's messy if you don't have good dust yeah. collection and everything, but uh, yeah. it's a great alternative for outdoor science. So if your business is outdoor signage uh, for horse farms, whatever, you know, restaurants and things like that or anything outdoor. Yep, businesses. Uh, yep. yep, businesses, exactly. Your your investment in a good UHD sign foam, it's basically a dense, a very dense mm -hmm. uh, core foam. Um, it, it kind of, the cost kind of outweighs, but if you're just doing it as a hobby, this stuff is like, you know, it can range up to $500 for a four by eight sheet you know, of two inch thick uh, sign foam. So it's, it's not cost prohibitive if you're doing it as a hobby, but if you're doing it as a business, it's a good alternative. For outdoor yeah, but this, that brings up a good point though, uh, Laney, it's all relative. Um, obviously I have, you know, our, the digital woodcarver businesses and, uh, you know, this is something that you, as a carvers out there, you might look at doing is, you know, get in a different mindset um, that, you know, if you had something like this or, you know, that's in front of something, these businesses, they want their, you know, the front of their building to be snappy. If it looks trashy or whatever on that, they, you know, obviously people will think that their product or whatever they're doing is that same caliber. So, you know, yeah, you have to invest in it. The other thing is, is like you say, it can weather and last, you know, because that person, if they're paying let's just say, you know, five, six hundred to thousand dollars for a sign like this, um, you know, they expect it to last, you know, so, you know, if it, if it deteriorates after a year or two of being outside, so you got to invest in some of that. But one of the other things that I really love about this product is once you carve it virtually, you obviously have to put a finish on it, paint yep. and stuff like that. But yep. there is no sanding. I mean, it literally gives you a surface oh. where you're ready to, um, you know, you know, put a finish yeah. on it after that's done. It's a beautiful finish. Now, uh, if for an example, for uh, like outside of subdivision, sometimes you'll see signs that have almost that look like a, a rock type texture, you know, real rough texture. Uh, or it could be a nice, clean, shiny finish like what you see on Burl sign and everything. This is the, the, the sign foam. Uh, I've used automotive paint on it. I've used regular paint on it. I've done uh, kind of, you know, different texture spray textures to create rough texture to make it look like uh, stone 
yeah. in things and all it yeah. it because it, it's there's no sanding to it like you said it's beautiful right off the cnc uh being able to apply a nice finish and all uh but i do recommend a uh, priming it first you know uh right. with a good primer uh before your top coats of color or what have you uh and i believe it, that's that's probably just a a yeah that's that's probably a straight uh, type of enamel yep. automotive. Terry uh, painted those, um, um, both of those signs for us. And I, I'm guessing that's just a. Yeah. Yeah. Terry. Type of, uh, manual, or yeah. Manual. He's an old auto guy, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have that. So uh, U UHD and I, I, I believe I'm saying that right. Ultra high density sign foam UHD. I get my letters, my acronyms mixed up, but uh, uh, that is the, the term of it. All right. Let's get uh, back to here. Bro, got a couple of uh, questions here. Um, okay. uh, one of the questions that popped up is, where do you get a good mop? Well, believe it or not, guys, for me, my sanding mops that I use, I, I use them kind of in my drill press or actually in my lathe too. Uh, you know, I kind of turn my lathe high speed on, depends on the size of my project. I get mine from Harbor Freight, believe it or not. Uh, they come, they look like a ball, uh, like a foam ball, and they come in different grits and things. But uh, places like um, uh, Klingspor, yeah, uh, stock room in in uh, Canada. I know those guys carry them. Uh, there's also a little different. There's some of them that are sandpaper that are made up of um, you know strips. It's cut into strips and formed into a ball. But you also get some of them that are actually a type of a foam, right? Molded into you know that that sanding foam type stuff. Yeah. So yeah. William, uh, look around. I get mine from Harbor Freight. I have Harbor Freight right down the road, and they carry three different grit sizes, and they're different colors, red, green, and and uh, kind of, I think it's black. But uh, I get the red and green, which is the 220 and uh, 120. Um, and uh, that's what I use because it's kind of gentle. It contours to the curves of my 3D models and things. Uh, but Kling's Pours, you know, another place, uh, you know, Stockroom Supply, they're, they're all over the place. You can probably find them on Amazon. You just got to be mindful. Like Burl said, some of them are, you know, foam type. Some of them are sandpaper strips that are just kind of like, you know, orientated in different orientations and all. And you just got to be mindful of which ones are going to be gentle on your project and which ones are going to be kind of aggressive. Uh, and yeah. I kind of like the foam ones myself, Burl. I like, they're, they're a little bit more gentle, especially yeah. on the high quality 3D details. So Now, if you're going for some detail on some 3D stuff, um you know your little dremel tools it's not quick but um you know especially if you got a wood that wants to be a little contrary um going against those grains that create some fingers and stuff out there a little um like a roto zip or a little um you know uh, dremel tool uh, with some little sanding pads they make some little um you know ones that actually yep. are a bit you know that come to a point or a little ball yep. nose stuff like that yeah, yeah, I've used those, um, yeah. especially if you're you're 3D because you go in in the grains basically all different directions into the grain. Uh, obviously, when your wood is the drier it is, the sharper your bits. You should get as a little more, and the harder the woods, um, you'll get a little cleaner surfaces. But sometimes you will get those fuzzies, uh, in especially in certain you know how you hit a certain angle, certain grains, um, and those little. Dremel tools will work too for you. Yeah, exactly. Now, Jeff Cleary has, uh, he's got three short comments and all kind of a little tip or, or what he does. Uh, he pretty finishes everything with a furniture lacquer. Uh, he'll paint it in with acrylic paint um, uh, after the pre-finish. And then uh, he'll take a spray bottle of water and a paper towel and wipe the paint right off the lacquer. Uh, but before... Uh, he does. He'll shoot another coat of lacquer over the whole thing to keep it from bleeding. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, and then uh, he uses an automotive urethane base coat and clear coat uh, and everything. So thanks for sharing that with us, Jeff. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm guessing that that is uh, similar to like a masking where you're putting a sealer on it and then put a acrylic paint and then the, the lacquer will allow you to wipe off your high surface areas. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, yep. you know, he's basically using that lacquer as that, as that seal coat and everything. Yep. Yep. Uh, so right. that's pretty good. Uh, Troy jumps in and says that he uses a four aught steel wool to remove tiny air bubbles and fibers and things uh, to make it like satin smooth. 
uh, and then use air to remove the dust that were a tack cloth and then, you know, uh, put a finish. Yeah. So, I've used uh, steel wool, not a lot in the, in the past. Um, the thing you got to, what I find is you got to watch, it, it does create, I know you're doing dust on all that, but it does create a lot of those fibers that you've got to make sure that those are gone. Those little steel right. fibers, if they show up uh, in hair, like hair looking into your finishes, you got to make exactly. sure that those are gone. But I mean, it's, it's the way with any sanding, you got to get rid of that. Um, you know, the, the right. dust particles and also the, the uh, sand, if it's sandpaper that's left on, on the wood. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about another uh, uh, product. Um, this is uh, general finishes. Uh, it's seal a cell. Uh, and it's basically think of Oak. Oak is very open, poor grain. Uh, and, uh, it's a sealer, like almost using like what their guys are using the lacquer and stuff, but, uh, it helps seal in those open cells of mm -hmm. the wood so that your top coats and everything are much smoother, uh, rather than being dimpled and, and, and sunk down because of that open cell. Uh, yeah. so it creates a nice, uh, finish, uh, you know, uh, smoother. So I've always used that when I'm working with oak and stuff, uh, seal a cell, uh, to seal it. Uh, to before I build up my finish coats and stuff. All right, bro. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, uh, I did see that um, <laughs> that picture of your dragon lady, uh, uh, Game of Thrones. That is absolutely gorgeous. I think I've showed oh, it to you, Lane. The, it's a V carve. It's a, a photo carve with a V. Uh, it's one of the best ones I've ever seen. Um, well, you know, that's a great segue into uh, exactly. what, what I was about to say now, I have um, uh, Pete Woolley. Uh, he did a B carve, uh, and uh, in um, I want to I want to say it was uh, Corian. Uh, but uh, what he what what he does with his is uh, he will spray paint it uh, to kind of create that contrast. Yep. Uh, and then you know do the sand. And as far as a V carve, like you were saying, I haven't seen the Game of Thrones ones. I'd love to see that one. But for me, this is one of the best results I've seen on a, uh, a photo V carve uh, in, in the contrast and everything. Now, of course, he's still got some additional sanding to do around the border. But, man, the detail that that paint brought out in that, that phenomenal. carve is actually pretty good. It's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't generally get results like that with my photo V carve. So uh, way to go, Pete Woolley. Yeah. On that one. But uh, I'd love to see the Game of Thrones. So I have to check that it out. It is. Um, I'll, I'll send you the picture of it. Um, it's going to be in that same category as that. Pete did an excellent job with the, the uh, little kid there. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So it was uh, really good. And and you have to, when you're doing those photo V cards, you got to have some kind of finish, some kind of contrast to it and stuff. Uh, yeah. you know, so, uh, to really bring out that carving and I'm, and that was just some good results. So when you mentioned that, I just wanted to share that yeah. yep. uh, thing. Now, bro, let's talk a little bit about stains and all, uh, some, some folks, uh, like to stain their material before they carve. Uh, some folks like to, you know, stain after the fact, uh, and all it, it really just kind of depends, but, um, I'm a big advocate of using a pre-stain conditioner on, on my materials before I stain to help prevent blotching because some materials are prone to blotching more than others. Uh, and then of course you've got uh, things like gel stains, right. That kind of help reduce the blotching a little bit, uh, or you've got your, you know, oil based and, and water based stains and all. Uh, but uh, I'm not a stain guy. A lot of times no. uh, <laughs> when you're talking about that, it's like, yeah, if yeah, I want to I, yeah. I use a dog wood to carve with, but um, now, where I, I will or will use it, and you talked about the gel stain, um, and I used to do this a lot, especially in your V-carves, the gel will allow you to do the get the contrast. If you want those cavities to be dark, and that's what I used to tell people all the time, you take that gel stain, you put it over it, it will go down into the cavities, and then you can wipe off the surface. So there's like very little stain on the outside, but you get the cavities, and then you get that contrast where it's very lightly stained to very thick. But I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about the stains. I'm, I've am i struggled with it, especially the thin stuff, um, you know, the the oil base. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's rough. I'm going to actually uh, turn this. Um, I'm going to kind of lean towards some of our uh, customers and how they finish their projects and all. And uh, a good, this one is good. It's, it's from Travis Harrington. 
Now, Travis will, when he's staining his wood uh, in his material, he'll actually pre-finish it. Uh, you know, he'll do the stain and then he'll do the finish. And he usually uh, uses like a uh, general finishes armor seal or just whatever top coat he's using. Uh, water-based, uh, if he's using water-based stains and stuff, um, he always uses water-based finishes for that. But he finishes his board completely before he carves. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that because of the fact that uh, I don't want to stain after the fact and then that stain bleed into my carving, right? So he stains his board, he seals it and finishes it, then he does his carving. And generally, I'm assuming that if he's going to do the natural wood is the contrasting color in the carve, he just leaves it be. If he's going to do some color in that carving, uh, then he'll most likely use an aura mask or something like that to, you know, uh, after he puts this clear coat on, he'll put the aura mask on, then carve and paint, you know, to finish it up. And that's when it comes to finishes as far as stains, because I am not a stain guy, just like you, Burl. Uh, yeah. That is going to be my tip. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm a kind of a big advocate of staining before carving. So it, because that stain, you can't control it. Uh, yeah. Bleeding, wicking, you just can't. Unless, you know, that's your intent and all. Uh, right. And um, now, know, go ahead. I was going to say, Baron talked about dyes. I'm not familiar with those a lot and haven't used them. So if you know anything about those, Laney. Um, I do. And let me, um, let me get uh, in here real quick and let me get back to this photo. So when it comes to uh, stains and dyes, uh, where's my... Right here. Now, there's only one die that I really use. Um, but in the case of this eagle, Burl, this was a cherry eagle. And um, I wanted, instead of just clear coating the cherry, I wanted to kind of bring out some of the uh, tones around the edges of the stars and in the deep crevices yeah. of the wings and things. Uh, and uh, what one of the products I used was called a, to it's a toner die. It's made by Touch Up Solutions. And uh, we'll, we'll pop back into a big screen. So, but uh, it's uh, made by Touch Up Solutions and it's a toner dye. Now, it's a, it comes in a spray format. Uh, so, it's really, you can really kind of um, uh, pinpoint where you want it to go and then it wipes really nicely. Uh, now, when I use this, I kind of, I kind of tend to go with their clear coat to, so the two match. Uh, and this is uh, their, their pre cat, it's a lacquer. Pre-catalyzed lacquer, touch-up finishes. Uh, it's their top coat and everything over the dyes. But when it comes yeah. to dyes, I'm other. You know, there's a lot of different toners and dyes out there, and I'm not familiar, 100% familiar with them uh, and, and everything. Uh, so I tend to stick to the uh, touch-up solutions dye sprays, their toner dyes, uh, when I want to highlight certain areas, and that's right. about all the information input I could put on dyes and all. Yeah. So Baron in the turned out very nice. I remember, uh, uh, you know, that the Eagle was, and I could see that. Um, yeah. yeah. It, in the highlight areas and everything, it came out really uh, good. It's hard to see in the photo and stuff, but it came out uh, uh, very well. So um, Baron down in the comment section, if you want to share with the other users, uh, some of the types of dyes and all uh, go for it. Uh, that would be great. Uh, cause that's all I have on dies. <laughs> so, um, now we, we've, we, you've heard me mention general finishes a lot. And I told you at the beginning of this video, I didn't want to get specific into brands, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, because I use men wax, I've used, you know, uh, rust -oleum, so I've used general finishes and all yeah. you, you, when it comes to finishes, pick, you know, try the, you know, try a variety and then whatever works best for you or whatever you like, you know, stick with it. I'm a general finishes guy. Uh, the only problem is, is there's only one place in town that sells general finishes for me to be able to just run down and go get, if I run out of a finish. Uh, and they always don't carry a full stock of things. So for me to run down to Lowe's and buy my Minwax stains and things like that, it's easier, right? So we kind of do with what we've got or, you know, what we, what we, for necessity, we have to use what we use for necessity. So I'm not a big general finishes guy and that's all I use, or I'm not a big Minwax guy. Just pick a finish that uh, works best for you and um, uh, kind of stick with it. You know, uh, that's kind of my opinion. Now, Burl, there's also the close to the wood. Let's get uh, back into a big screen here. 
There's also the close to the wood finishes. Uh, and this is kind of uh, where I want to kind of start to end up at. Uh, okay. But we have, um, And I'm going to show a few samples of close to the wood finishes. And then I want to uh, talk about them a little bit. Let me pull them all out here. Oh, my goodness. I got, I got, got finishes everywhere. Sorry about my microphone knocking there. All right. So uh, my go-to close to the wood finish uh, is a... Um, bear with me a second here. Oh, what is my, is it Danish oil right here? Is it Danish yeah, oil? I've, it's been a yeah, while I, since I've used Danish oil, but yeah. I have used it on, on products. Yep. All right. So, uh, Danish oil, it's a hard drying oil. Okay. Uh, that means basically it's polymerized, uh, with, with hardeners and stuff. And, uh, it, it dries in the wood, not on the wood. So uh, it, it absorbs very well into the wood uh, and it dries to kind of that, that polymer, you know, plastic type, uh, you know, finish. Uh, it gives a nice uh, hand rubbed look and everything. Um, it's uh, when it reacts to the atmosphere, you know, oxygen in the atmosphere and everything, uh, it, uh, it dries really, really, really well and, and pretty quickly. So uh, I like a Danish oil finish. Uh, it's, it's, it's very... Uh, water, it's water resistant. Uh, it's got a nice satin finish to it. And, uh, it also serves as a good primer for bare woods. So, uh, you know, before applying paint and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. The thing, only thing I didn't, because it does absorb in the wood, I know it's a good natural finish. Um, sometimes I kind of like that s surface that, you know, right. your polys and stuff like that in the surface. So um, right. I was trying to find that picture of the dragon, but, uh, We'll have to do that at a later date, and I, I'd have to get Jeff's permission to. Yeah, to no problem. That, so. Uh, but uh, so Burl's talking about on the wood finish, you know, as well as uh, you know, kind of a finish that you can build up uh, pretty well. Uh, a tongue oil finish. Uh, this is uh, Formsby's tongue oil finish, but um, this is it's a high quality varnish balance of uh, uh, and there's that word varnish again, you know, that that general term and everything. Uh, but uh, it's balanced of basically uh, a tongue oil and some other penetrating oils and everything. It's nice balance and stuff. Now this, um, uh, it's the result. It, it's a transparent, deep, uh, uh, wet look. So Burl likes that built up look, you know, and this kind of, uh, you can build up this finished Burl and uh, it gives you kind of almost like that wet look, like that, you know, that, right. that surface and everything. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, it's not th and this one that, that I particularly use is the high gloss when I build right. it up it's a really high gloss and it gives it that real deep wet look and all, yep. um, it's good for, uh, penetrating, uh, and everything, but, uh, it, it does take multiple coats and it does give that plastic like finish that wet plastic like finish, you know, build up and all. So that's a good one. Now, um, uh, that leads me into the other close to the wood finish. So we, we've talked about, uh, Danish oil. We've talked about tongue oil. And then we have teak oil. Okay. So with uh, the teak oil, and I've got little notes here. So if you see me peeking over and all, because uh, it's hard to, but um, this uh, is great for outdoor uh, finishes, UV protection and uh, moisture resistance and things. Uh, it's specially formulated uh, for, it's great for woods like teak, mahogany, rosewood, things like that. Uh, it comes in a wipe on or a brush on. Uh, uh, finish and it penetrates deep. Uh, it's, it's a nice, rich look. Uh, it, and it, and the finish kind of, it's that warm glow hand rubbed finish. So, uh, you know, so, uh, that's kind of the, the teak oil and all, and basically their little default thing, it says blocks UV and moisture rays, uh, penetrates deep into the wood, right? That's kind of their little slogan, but, um, it's, uh, it's one of those uh, for me for outdoor projects, uh, especially if I'm doing things uh, that's going to be outdoors and all, and I want that close to the wood finish, then I'll use a teak oil. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff just text you a picture of uh, the dragon if you want to catch that. If you can do that as as we uh, talk here, he did. Uh, he did. And um, so, Burl. Now, while I'm let me pull this up because I can pull it up and transfer it right to the yeah. screen. While you do that, why don't you take over and talk about some of the you know, do you, do you have the pictures on the laser etching that we've done this way, this week? I do. 
However, I got to transfer them over to the other one. So uh, let's talk about Serum Mask a little bit, uh, and then I'll pull up the pictures and stuff if you want to. Yeah, we will. Um, Let me. One of the things that we've done this week, we talked about this in the past, and uh, it's kind of changing the subject here just a little bit. Um, but you know, with the with the lasers, we did a session on laser um, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to grab. I, I left my cans over on my desk. You can see them back um, <laughs> right over there, but they're aerosol cans um, of putting a product on whether it's steel or glass and ceramic uh, and laser over and over top of it and leaving the form. And Lane's got some pictures that we'll show here in just a little bit, but I, I tried that this week and we wanted to really uh, talk about it at this point. Uh, some of the test results. This is um, uh, stainless steel, just a little keychain that I, purchased a uh, half a dozen of them with, and I know it's real re reflective uh, on that, but, um, and we'll show you some pictures of doing it. But what you do is you simply spray this on top of this. In this case, it's stainless steel. I um, believe you can do glass and ceramic too. You do get those products for their particular application. So you get uh, for metals, they call it metal, um, and you just spray it on there. And it just sprays on, it's very thin. Um, it actually sprays on like a white and then you put it, let it dry just a little bit so that it isn't runny. And then you put this under the laser, you run your laser over top of it and it will leave a film on there. And this is a digital wood carver. Once again, this is a stainless steel key ta tag and that turns it black. Uh, it does a good job. There is a couple things I want to point out um, when, when Lainey comes back and shows us pictures, a couple things I want to point out. I'll be right there. It is very expensive. That can, those aerosol cans you see back there are like $50 to $60 a can. So it is very expensive. Um, the other thing is it does take a high-powered laser. So our 6-watt lasers that we put on our small units will not burn this. I tried doing like, um, and this was done on a, uh, like a 90-watt laser. Um, a 60 watts would, would also do it. Um, I started out like 10%, which would be uh, equivalent to like a, a six, uh, eight watts. It would leave it, but it was so faint that you could barely see it. Um, so the, the, the bad news is, is our little six watt laser um, will not allow us to do this. That, that's a plug for the bigger ones. But I, we wanted to tell you the test results of, you know, buying that spray, uh, putting it on your, your metals. And this was a keychain. I it took a little bit for me to learn how to do it and get it balanced on there, but it did give us a really good results. Try to zoom in there, and then uh, uh, Laney will show us a video. We'll show a video of it running and what it looks like. As far as doing it, you literally just lay this down, spray that on there, let it dry five minutes, run it with a laser, and then literally to get it off, you just put this under the water, and that water would will simply just run the um anything that's not lasered and then you take a, a rag i took a paper towel and just wiped off a little bit on the black surface um, but it wiped that off and it gives a good result now i can't contest to how long this is a keychain if i put this in my pocket how long that surface would last um, whether that would come off after a week of use or keys rubbing up against it and would wear it away. So I can't tell how long it would last, but it does give good results. And really that's our only way uh, of doing metals, glasses, um, that type of thing with a laser. Once again, I want to note that that did take um, a large laser. Uh, I'm going to say a 60 to 90 watt laser, not a six watt laser on that. Um, let me, I'll go grab the cans and you guys can look at them as far as the brand. Somebody's asking about that, uh, brand on that, um, uh, on the laser product. If you got some yeah. pictures, uh, Laney for showing the etched on metal, I'll grab the cans. I do. Yep. And, uh, while you're grabbing those cans, uh, the brand is Sarah Mark. Uh, and also there's also a brand out there called Endura Mark, but, uh, we use the Sarah Mark. Uh, so let me get um, these images pulled up here. 
I had them and then I hit the wrong button and closed them away. There you go. Let's get that back into. Um, yeah, if you want to pull that up uh, while you're working on that, I'll show this. Um, this is it. And once again, like Lanny says, there's other brands. We're not promoting a particular brand. We just did what you guys would have to do and go out and search on the web and find it. Um, this one in particular is for metal black. Um, and um, as far as how long it will last, um, I think it will. I mean, it don't take a lot of spraying on there. I wasn't running this can a lot. You just take a couple, a couple shots across it. So as far as how long that would last, um, you know, on keychains, I, I couldn't tell you. And then this is the other brand of, and this is black for ceramic and glass laser marking spray. So uh, we talked about this the last couple of weeks when we did the laser sessions and we wanted to uh, dedicate a little time to show you results. And uh, Lenny and I purchased some of that. But the bad news is our small lasers, um, it's going to take yeah. more power. Exactly. And, uh, your large it's, lasers, it, it does well. Um, go out and try it. Buy a can of it. They do have it in different forms. Um, once again, I get a little lazy, and the aerosol is a quick, you know, I can shoot it on there. Um, but they do have some print paint or spray on. Isn't yeah. that absolutely cool. gorgeous? Yeah, that looks great. And, Burl, could you do me a favor? Who was this again? Was it? This was Jeff. 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 Jeff, yeah. great job, man. Great job. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's um, it, along with uh, Pete there that did it. These are the two two of the best that I have seen um, in promoting the the V Carve um, photo V Carve, uh, on, and that comes standard. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lazy Laney, on um, what products it comes with. The new version of V Carve Pro comes uh, desktop Pro and Aspire come with the photo V Carve standard. application. Yes. Yep. And now if you have an older version, we, I do still sell that module. And the other thing that comes with that module is um, 3D, you know, like a photo for litho paints. And that comes standard with Aspire, but not VCarve desktop or pro. So we do sell that that module on there. This is a keychain, same one I'm showing you there. Uh, so we're kind of jumping around here at the end. But, yeah, uh, sorry. I'm, yeah, I, I didn't mean to pull that. I, no, I, I love it. Uh, yeah. Let me get back uh, so you can finish uh, talking about. Let's start. Let's uh, go ahead and wrap up what you were saying no, about. I, I was I was pretty well done. But that's the two products on that. Um, and our our customers. Um, I know you and I have had conversations. We just really whether we didn't take the time or it was all in the finish uh, doing it. Um, both, the, both of us have tried it and really our, our results just, we weren't happy with them and yeah. to promote them. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. uh, yeah, I'm not. And, and, you know, back before it was part of the Vetric V-Carve desktop of pro, there was photo V-Carve, right. That does both. Yeah. The v -carve. And I never really pushed uh, the photo V-Carve that much only because I never got the greatest results, right? I know. Yeah. And if I, I, how can I teach it if I, if I can't get good results? Now, other people were blowing me away with the results that they were getting. And uh, the one way that I found, Burl, that I was able to get the good results is I would use cherry wood. I would paint that cherry, the face of the cherry, white. White, uh, yeah. And when I carved, uh, when this, when this piece of block wood and all would be, let's say, sitting, I use the mantle test or whatever, you know, if it's sitting on a mantle. And you're standing away. Uh, can you see what it is? You know, can you make out the detail? Right. Right. And that was the only way I was able to get good results. Uh, and then, you know, but but because people wanted to be able to do that, Vetric decided to incorporate the Photo V Carve into Desktop Pro and Aspire for version 10, right? And then you see results like this, bam! I mean, and you see results right. like what Pete Woolley did, boom! And I'm like, wow, you know, great results. So. It can be done, ladies and gentlemen. Not saying that I've ever done it, but it can be done, you know. So it's just all about the settings and, and you know, just, you know, practice makes perfect. Now, um, Burl, coming back to uh, the keychain uh, yeah. and everything, and I'm kind of. Uh, you have the little video. Uh, I don't know. If, and that's, it, it's really. I do, but let's. Uh, oh, that's what I'm looking for is that little error there. So here is uh, Burl's in his laser. He's got kind of, this is where he was set up doing that carving and all. And uh, Burl, I think I brought the video over as well. Um, People have seen lasers run. I mean, if you don't, 
it's not a big deal. It's it, you can see all the key chains there. Um, they are, you know, painted white. That's a white product um, when it goes on, but it, it, it burns. Um, and then literally it's very, very easy to, to do. Um, literally I stuck those under a faucet and um, it just, it, the, the white part just washed away, but you just take a damp, uh, you know, rag and wipe off because the black area, you see where it looks like a little burnt there. Um, it works, wipes off and, and gives you a nice, nice surface there. Yeah. And, um, Burl for some, oh, there it's it is. Okay. So sorry. Um, let's see here. We'll, uh, we'll wrap up with that and, uh, I'll, but we'll, um, I'll transfer it over. Well, I didn't transfer it. Uh, so receive files. It's on its way now. Okay. So. Anyhow, so ladies and gentlemen, we've talked a little bit uh, about different finishes and finish types and stuff. Uh, let's um, look and see if we've got any questions. Now, Burl, I did want to um, kind of highlight some of uh, what our customers uh, do. Remember we talked, I talked to you about that. Um, some of our customers... Um, for instance, one customer, his recommendation, I asked them, hey, give me some of your tips or tricks without your trade secrets and all, you know, on your finishes and all. Uh, one customer said, always, uh, you know, in some form or fashion, always sign and date your work. Because uh, when you're selling your products and all, if someone ever asks, hey, could you do that again? You know, could you make me that? I really like that. That you can actually remember back, or, you know, and refer back to, you know, what you made and what date you made it and all. So you can refer back to that. So that's a good tip that I thought was cool. So, you know, if I it's. I was the only one that couldn't think uh, dates and when I did stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but um, uh, most of our uh, customers uh, enjoy a lacquer finish because one of the drying times. Uh, and also it's a bit, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, especially the rattle can lacquer, uh, you know, it's a, it's a slow build and stuff. Um, but, uh, so with That's probably my, my preference is uh, I've used that lately. Lacquer works good. Uh, I will, will tell you to, you know, put a respirator on that lacquer is, um, yeah, it's awfully easy to grab that stuff and just, you know, uh, put it on there, but it, it creates some perfume, uh, you know, some smells. Be yeah, it does have some high VOCs. Now, let's talk about this real quick. Uh, your varnishes and your polyurethanes and stuff over time. Now, it varies from different, you know, material to material and brand to brand. But over time, uh, there will be a yellowing effect. You just there, there's a hard way to get around that. Uh, now, to help even even with some lacquers, especially, you know, rattle can lacquers and all. But now. Uh, one of the things that uh, I use is a cat and the can is just totally destroyed, but a, a cab acrylic lacquer. Um, and this is a water white lacquer, uh, which means uh, it does not yellow. Uh, I have projects that have uh, that I still have from, you know, 10 to 12 years ago, uh, and they're still nice and clear, no yellowing and things like that. So uh, if I'm if I want to maintain that non yellowing and all, then I use a, a pre cat or a cab acrylic lacquer. Uh, and this is you, you, your your uh, HVLP sprayer. It's a spray. You're not going to find it in a rattle can or uh, anything like that. It's, you know, Sherman Williams and, and places like that. You know, you can get pre cat or cab acrylic lacquer, but it does have a shelf life, ladies and gentlemen. So that's one of the things. Um, uh, that uh, you got to keep in mind. So it, it only, especially, you know, with that pre-catalyzed, it only stays good for a certain amount of time. So if you use a lot of it, then you can buy it by the gallon. But, you know, I'd, you know, recommend right. smaller. Quart pieces, or, yep, yep. Uh, and all. And oh, cool. Burl, uh, let's see here. I believe. I didn't see any questions or any, any comments there that, uh, um, unless i missed them on that so yeah and i'm uh, sorry the video did not come over oh, that's it, fine it, 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 it's fine people have seen laser friend <laughs> it's oh. not transferring and i yeah. meant to have it prepared and i didn't have it prepared in time oh, that's good um, um but i wanted to point out as uh, one of the things as we're wrapping up um laney do we want to talk about um we want to talk about us and and throw some you know customers out there see if they'll respond to some of the things that we're wanting to do in the next I do. I do. Yeah. And I'm 
I wanted to do that at the beginning and I was waiting till you got on to ask you about that. And so you're asking me, so that's good. We're on the same page. Exactly. Uh, so uh, let me do the introduction of that. And then if you could kind of uh, highlight what we're, what we're going to do. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a lot of you watching. Uh, many of you are digital wood carver customers. Many of you are not. So there we have a kind of a variety of people watching this, uh, this, this, kind of is directed towards our customers, right? To the people that own digital wood carvers. Uh, what we're hoping to do uh, in the very near future here is to be able to um, kind of promote a way for people that are looking to start a business, uh, you know, a small home-based business, especially with everything going on with COVID-19 and everything. Uh, and what packages of like machine or software and, and things like that, what would get them on the right foot? So we're looking to reach out to some of our customers, some of you guys and girls that are out in the audience and all that would be willing to do an interview with us live online uh, with Burl and I. Uh, we're going to have we, we'd like to get a little panel of uh, three or, you know, uh, four of you guys and girls uh, to not tell us your trade secrets. We don't want right. to we don't want to share your trade secrets and stuff, but to share your story. Um, did you add the digital wood carver to your existing business? Was the digital wood carver kind of the Kickstarter to your current business? You know, um, what tips you or, or advice you may have for someone looking to start a business, that type of thing. We want to do a, just a brief interview with you uh, and uh, just give some insight to those individuals that are out there looking to, uh, you know, possibly start a home based business and how a CNC can help them do that. And we'd like to talk to some of you because you guys and girls have been doing bang up jobs. You've been successful in the things you do. And so you're going to see us put a post out and we'd love for you. If you have a webcam and a microphone and yes. willing to be interviewed live online, we'd love for you to participate. Now we can't choose everybody, but you know, we're going to do our best to try to, you know, choose some, just a few people. So bro, anything you want to add to that? No, I, you did a great job of introducing that. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, we would like to do is we get these questions quite often, you know, people come up to us at shows and that's the whole concept of what we're trying to do here is think of different areas and ways, questions, uh, Lainey, if I, I don't even know how many shows we've done now, but we've done a lot of them. Yeah. And one of the things that we get is people, you know, how do I even get started with a business? And we know we've got tons of our customers that have, whether they already had it existing and this added to it, or literally this is where they started from. The digital woodcarver was their focal point. Or their Kickstarter, you know? Exactly. And so we know we've got a lot of customers that are successful out there. And, um, you know, like like Lenny says, if we can pick your brain just a little bit, or if it's something that we've already, you know, said, but it's something that you're doing that uh, kind of affirms of, you know, that they can buy a machine, be successful with it, and maybe give some people a little bit of insight. You know, where do I start? Um, do I start locally, you know, web-based, um, you know, uh, however they done it and everybody's got a different story. So when you volunteer, it isn't, you know, uh, a right or wrong. It just, you know, this is maybe just giving people creative ideas of, oh, you know, that, that worked well, let's say in the, you know, Texas, you know, maybe in New York, uh, I could do something similar to it, put a right. little different twist or whatever to it and yeah. uh, come up with something. Yeah. You know, guys, some some people start off at the farmers markets and the flea markets and the craft fairs and things. And some people just sell online or some people, you know, um, uh, they either have their website or they sell on places like eBay or Etsy or they just, you know, sell locally to their community. Whatever the whatever your story or your situation is and all, we'd love to hear about it. And that insight helps other people kind of gauge, hey, I could do this, too, because right. it's very achievable. Uh, you know, a CNC, I've always said, is a money maker. It has the potential of making a product. That product is sellable uh, and you can you can earn an income off of it. How big an income or how small kind of depends on what you put into it. Right. But, you know, it's doable. So we would love to hear from you. And so I'll be putting a post in the Facebook owners group about that. If you're willing to participate in that live event, bro, we don't have an exact date on when we would do this. Right. But I know we've scheduled details. Right. I know we've scheduled about three here. I don't know if this is number two in that schedule or number mm -hmm. three. Okay. So uh, I don't know that it'll be in two weeks, maybe looking about three or four weeks when we do that. Or we may even open up and do a totally different day. Do a, you know, uh, we'll work on schedules here. 
but um, I, I love the concept of yeah. the last few years. One of the things that we've done is we've invited customers to help us in our shows. That's been phenomenal. I, I love it when, you know, Laney and I, we work with this every day. And somebody that doesn't know us, that comes up to us, you know, we're representing the company. We're we, sales Exactly. Right? Yeah. We are supposed to say that it does well. But when somebody can go over and, and to somebody that has a machine and says, you know, I'm not necessarily an employee of the company, um, but I do have one of the machines. I believe in it and what it does. Um, that is you yeah. know, phenomenal. And we just want to capture a little bit of that in this, if people are willing to. And you guys blow me away sometimes of, of how creative you've been in starting something or created a unique niche product. So that's what we're on caps here. Very good. Absolutely. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to say our goodbyes. Uh, we're about an hour and 10 minutes in. So I think we covered everything as far as finishes and all. So, uh, you know, think about Aura Mask, uh, either the 631 or the 813. 813 is what I go to, but I don't prepaint my boards, right? So we talked about that in the beginning. Your, your lacquers, your shellacs, and your stains and things. And not necessarily, it doesn't care about the brand, guys and girls. Uh, find a product that works good for you and, you know, uh, stick with it. Uh, and then, you know, it might be a variety of projects. It could be just one. Who knows? But uh, there's different tips and techniques and uh, there's information out there. I'm not a finished guy. I'm not the expert on it. And I'm sure, bro, you know, there's a few areas that he's not good on. But there's great videos on YouTube. Uh, I'll even throw a shout out to Mark Spagnolo, the Wood Whisperer. He has some amazing videos on the different types of finishes and the results you can expect and stuff. And he's the guy I learned from. So, you know, there's a lot of resources out there when it comes to finishes. There's all different types you can use. Figure out what's works best for you, what product works best, what material works best for indoor and outdoor use and things. And then, you know, make some sawdust and have some fun. So with that being said, Earl, if you don't have any goodbyes, I'm going to go ahead and just close us out. Till next time, stay safe. Yep, absolutely. Until next time, guys and girls, we'll see you soon. Thank you now.